Hope you all enjoyed the extended weekend and that you're all staying safe and healthy. I was able to work on my first Chrome extension, which is what you see here. So every time you open up a new tab, it shows one of my wife's creations. Anyhow, if you're interested in creating a Chrome extension, feel free to ask me and I could walk you through the initial steps. By now you should have received the details for the individual SQL project. There is a deliverable due on April 7, which is next week. You have to come up with a proposal, and in that proposal you have to look for a job that you're interested in that relates to SQL, and it gives give me a general idea of what you plan to solve with the data that you find that's related to the job. You can find all the details here in the project, so please let me know, Slack me, if you have any questions about the individual project. Today we're going to cover MySQL string functions, which allows us to manipulate string data in a way that we can piece strings together, pull parts of a string out, chop it up. So it allows us to do this within S SQL commands and not have to query the data, then bring it into a programming language like Python to then manipulate the string data. In the second half, we're going to install a MySQL database on the cloud using AWS. Some of you have already done that if you were in the systems analysis and design class but we're going to create a new database instance. We're going to code our SQL statements a little bit differently. Instead of using table plus or PHP MyAdmin, we're going to write our SQL statements in a Jupyter notebook. In this way, we can easily interact with the database and, not, and then see the results immediately. And then by keeping it in the notebook, we then instantly create a working document to continually add to. So no longer will you have to copy and paste the task description from a Google slide and then paste it into a file. I will have that all ready for you inside a notebook. So go ahead and download a notebook called SQL Strings Functions Template from Brightspace under the Jupyter Notebooks module. You can download the notebook into your downloads directory, but preferably you, it'd be best to download it directly into the directory where you keep all of your notebooks. So that way you don't have to go through the extra step of downloading it. So I'm downloading it into a directory where I keep all of my notebooks. Then I can go to my dashboard. for Jupyter Notebooks, and I can open it up directly from there. The other option is you can upload it. You could drag the notebook here or upload it. And let's say if you went, you downloaded it into your downloads directory, you can just upload it from there. But since here I already downloaded directly into the notebooks directory, I can open it from here. We're going to use something called magic commands that will allow us to write SQL queries inside of our Jupyter Notebook. Magic commands are a set of convenient functions that are designed to solve some of the more common problems in standard data analysis. We have to install the IPython SQL extension, and this is the extension that actually allows us to write SQL queries directly into code cells and then execute those code cells to read the results back into the notebook. Go ahead and install it with pip within a code cell. Adding this exclamation mark is like running this command from terminal or the Windows command line. I already have it installed and that's why it's saying requirement already satisfied. Now the next thing is we have to install drivers to support MySQL data, database connections through IPython SQL. If we were to connect to a PostgreSQL, 
database, we would have to install its own drivers. To load the IPython SQL extension, we use the magic command called load extension. And magic commands are prefixed with a single or double percentage sign. So to load the extension, we do percent sign load underscore ext space sql. And if you need to reload it, you could do reload ext. And once it's loaded, we have to make a connection to the database we want to query from. For the string functions exercises, we're going to query the Sakila database. You'll have to update this connection string to match your database. Replace the username, password, host, and database. I'm going to add my connection details here. Make sure to always add that prefix LMU build gives you. The prefix also is required in the database name. And like the previous command, we have another magic command and it has a single percent sign. And the reason there's only a single percent sign is because it applies to only a single line here. If there are two percent signs, then it's for a multi-line code cell. Okay, so we're using the SQL extension, and that's the magic command we're going to use here. I'm just going to execute this line, and it will confirm if it makes that connection to the database. All good databases have their own set of string functions, but many do share the same name for particular functions. And some of these functions may be familiar to you because they're also seen in different programming languages like Python or JavaScript. There's quite a few, there are quite a few string functions available on MySQL's end, but we're only going to cover about 20% of them or so. So you can refer to here for which functions are available to you. So if you find yourself struggling to manipulate a string, there might be a function already available for you. Or you may not even have to do it in a programming language like Python. You could just do it within MySQL. The first String function you've already seen, used quite a bit, is the concatenate function, concat. So you're not going to have to write this, that's why I'm already providing the SQL for you because you've done it so many times. But just know that concat is a string function because it's dealing with strings. Concat function put together the first name and last name to give us full name. The next string function we're going to look at is the left function. And what it does, it takes a part of a string starting from the left. For this next task, what we're going to do is figure out what is the sum payment amount and the number of payments made for each hour between two dates. Okay. So that way we can group by, by the hour for a certain date. The group column will look like the date and just the hour. And we'll do that with the left function. What I'll do first is write a group by SQL query before doing the left function. Make sure to do the double percent sign followed by SQL for the magic command, and then below that is where you'll type in your SQL statement. Do select payment date, sum amount has sum amount, count to do the number of payments. from the payment table. We're filtering it down between two dates.
make sure to add the time to include all of July 31st. We'll group by payment date for right now. Let's make sure this works. When we run it, we only get one for the payment count because it's so granular for the payment date. It's going down to the second. What we're going to do then is use the left function to take out the minutes and seconds to group it by the hour. We'll still keep in the date so we can see how many um, payments and the sum amount we get per day for a particular hour. What's left and then the string we want to pull from which is payment date and how many characters we want starting from the left. Well, we want this many characters, which is 13. We'll alias this expression as payment hour. Because we changed the alias, I have to also update the group by. Looking at the results, we get the sum amount and the payment count per hour for each day. So this is good if we want to find certain trends or to figure out are there any spikes or lulls when it comes to payments. Well, you might be wondering, well, we just covered date functions. Why can't we just use a date function against payment date? Personally, I feel left is easier if you want to maintain the same year, month, day format. But the date format function that we're going to use gives us more flexibility. You can go ahead and copy the statement we just made. We're going to replace the left function with the date format. The date format receives two arguments, the date that you want to format and how you want to format it. And the format options is what makes the date format a little bit more work because you have to know, okay, well, which placeholder do we need for the format that we want? Place left with date format. We'll maintain the same format of the year, month, day, and hour. Percent Y, keep the dashes in there. It's hard remembering is it capital M or lowercase m, lowercase d or capital D? If I run this, we should get the same results as above. Go check. And yes, we do. All right. Well, let's say an analyst wants to know, well, what are the trends for a particular hour? I don't care about the given day. I just want to know what is the trend for a date range per hour. We could use the same query and modify it such that it doesn't return the date, but only the hour. Go ahead and copy and paste it. We'll group only by the hour. All you have to do is remove the date portion in the formatting options. Make sure to remove the space as well. The results show us the sum amount and payment count per hour. It's kind of hard to figure out, okay, well, are there any spikes? Which hour is, hard, is higher or lower? We can sort it, but we're going to also, we're going to use another function to visually tell us. We're going to use the repeat function. We're going to repeat a certain character based on the number of times a payment was made. We could use it for the sum amount, but for this example, we use the payment count. 
Again, copy and paste the previous query. I'll add the repeat function on a new line, but it is still part of the select clause. Repeat, and we'll use asterisk. You could use any character that you want. The second argument tells repeat how many times do we need to repeat that string or character. We're going to repeat it based on the payment count. We'll order the results in descending order using the payment count graph expression. Get a nice looking graph here. Visually tell, okay, which hour has the highest payment count. In this situation, it's 6 p.m. And then which hour has the lowest? It looks like it's at nighttime at 10 p.m. Just like in Excel, it helps to format the output or numbers, especially if they're in the thousands or millions. So that way you're not looking at numbers and counting in chunks of three to add your own commas. We could use the MyScale format function to add commas to a number and then also use it to round the number of decimal places. We'll use the same query as above, but we'll expand the date range to include all of 2005 to increase the number size. So that way we get into the thousands. And because we're in the thousands, we'll use the format function to add commas. All right. So we'll add it to both the sum amount. I'll add this on its own line now because the select clause is getting pretty lengthy. And here's another case of chaining together multiple functions. And we're going to add two decimal places for the sum amount because it is a financial value. But for the payment count, we'll format it with commas, but zero decimal places. I forgot to inc update the date range to include all of 2005. All right. We added the commas. We, we kept the decimal places as we wanted it to. The one issue here is because the numbers started getting bigger, this graph is getting unwieldy. What I do sometimes is I'll update the repeat function to lessen the number of characters to display for the graph. So we can split this in half. So let's say we'll divide it, or not split in half, but we'll shorten it by dividing the count by 10. OK. All right, the numbers are kind of close together, so it's hard to see dramatic changes, but you can still tell which which hour has the most. Right. Make sure to save. Jupyter Notebooks does autosave, but just to be safe, be sure to click the Save button. Okay, moving on from this query, we're going to use the substring function, which takes a part of a string and gives you back that part of the string, but you can specify at which position of the string you want to pull from. And then to add another argument, you could say, well, 
from that position, how many characters do you want to pull out? What we're going to do here is we'll select only 30 characters of the film description, but don't include the first two characters, which is for most of the descriptions, the letter A and a space. So a lot of the descriptions says something like A space, here, astounding epistle or a fanciful documentary. Seems a little bit redundant, so that's why we're going to take it out using the substring function. I'll select the description first, just so you can see what it looks like. limit it to only 10 films. Okay, all the descriptions have the same pattern. So let's say if we want to take it out. Sorry for the background noise, that's my dog. So if you hear panting, barking, that's the dog. Substring description and we're used to starting from the zero position but for substring it starts at one so we want to start at the third position so one two three will exclude the a in the space and then we only want 30 characters from that third position This might be useful if you're selecting your film, your films, or what a product, and you only want to show a preview of your description. You could use something like substring. Next function, the substring index function, is very similar to substring, but instead of using the position of a character, it uses a delimiter. So it's going to pull a substring based on wherever that delimiter is. So you can use delimiters such as commas, spaces, semicolons, colons, as a way to figure out where to pull out part of a string. So that substring. Okay. We're going to select the address information but we only want to get the address number, so the, the street number from the address. And then in another expression, we want to figure out, well, what is the street type? Or just get the last word of the street type. I'll first select the address. Get a sample of 10 rows. Select address from address. Oh, I forgot the magic command. All right, so we're going to only select the street number, 47, 28, and then we're going to select the last word of the address. So in this situation, we're not going to get Santiago de Compostela way, it's just way. And in the address, the delimiter is a space. We'll get this address number first. So it's a string, then the delimiter, here's the space. And then how many of them do we want from that to one? We only want just one occurrence. And then we'll get the street type.
but we have to move from the back. Okay. Instead of guessing the number of positions or the number of times that delimiter shows up, we could just say negative one and it'll just get the last instance. still include address here as a way to spot check. Let's see. Oh, I forgot to put index for the address number. So it pulls out this address number and then the street type using the substring index based on the space delimiter. We have the L case function available to us to lowercase and new case to uppercase. To see it in action, we'll select the title in its raw state, then lowercase the title, and then also select the raw special features, but then in a separate expression, uppercase it. For all of the examples moving forward, we'll limit the results to 10. We're going to combine string functions to only capitalize the first letter of the actor's name. Because right now, the actor's name is all uppercase. We're just going to work with the first name. I did select first name, we'll see that it's all uppercase. We'll do this step by step, we'll do this in four steps. So the first part is we're going to select the first name as is, and then we're going to use the left function to only get the first letter of the first name. Keep it that as is, but what we want to do is for the rest of the name is lowercase it. So we'll copy this query. We'll select everything but that first letter of the first name. And to do that, we'll use the substring function. To skip over that first letter, we'll start at the second position. So we're getting close. You can probably guess the next action that we're going to take is lowercase the back end of the first name. with L case. To put it together, we'll use concat. I'll put this all on one line just so it's clear to us. We don't need to add a space in between because it's all going to be joined together as one. Sounded like I was uh, marrying two people. And I will rename this first name Y's first letter. function we're going to cover is trim. 
This is particularly handy if you have some dirty data and there are some leading and trailing spaces that can throw off formatting if you're displaying the data or if you're trying to do counts on a certain column and you find that the strings look similar but they're slightly thrown off because of added spaces. In the Sequila database, there are no leading and trailing spaces, so I'm making up some variables here just to show how Trim removes those spaces. Let's add some lines here so you can see up top. We haven't seen this yet, but this is how you set variables in SQL. This is, this is called a user defined variable. We use a set function and then proceed the variable name with an at symbol. This variable has spaces in it, so I'm going to apply it here in the SQL statement. Or you can apply trim to a literal string. I'm going to remove the spaces here, which it's kind of hard to verify, but if I double click on the string, there are, it shows there are spaces. If I double click here, the spaces are gone. If I double click on this one, there are spaces. This one doesn't have a space. But it really comes through when you start running queries and the spaces start throwing off the results. Or if you query the data and display it on a web page and you see text is misaligned, it's usually because of spaces. So that's why you would want to use the trim function.